Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, webinar where we are going to be looking at uh, 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 the uh, US stock market. And in particular, uh, we're going to focus on one stock today. We're going to do something slightly different to what we normally do in this session. But um, before all that, can I just thank you for coming along and for taking time out in your busy day to join myself, Anna, and my husband, David. I can see down through the list of attendees, we've got uh, some of our regular visitors. And I know we've got some new visitors as well. So if it's your first time joining us, um, I hope you enjoy what you will learn in this session. But as always, before we can move over to the charts, uh, can I just draw your attention to the disclaimer? that I know you can see on your screen, as you know, trading and investing can be a risky business. So please, please don't ever think of using money that you cannot afford to lose. As always, we will be looking at the charts through the prism of volume price analysis, just in case you are new and you don't know what volume price analysis is. It's the concept of analysing a chart through the prism of the price action and the volume. It's a very, very special relationship that these two leading indicators have. Um, volume price analysis, or VPA, as it's sometimes um, shortened to, is an expression that uh, we actually came up with in 2013. There is volume spread analysis and there is volume and price analysis. But volume price analysis is something that uh, David and I, we wanted a, um, a way of conveying uh, what we were going to pardon. A catch-all catch phrase. That's a really good way of describing it. And that's why it's called volume price analysis. And it's sort of been taken up and uh, and spread um, all around the world, really, because I think we are now translated in about 10 different languages. So it's not just the, the English version. The latest versions that will be going up this year or early part of next year, there's a Spanish version. And there's also a South Korean version. There will be. I, and a Turkish one as well. Um, a lot of there are a lot of Turkish traders who I know um, use the methodology, and it is a methodology. As I said, it's a price action and volume, but we have also uh, broadened it out to include support and resistance. We use candles and candle patterns. We have since the beginning of our journey into the financial market, going back oh, over twenty years now, and also the concept of time, uh, not just the uh, chart that you trade, but multiple time frames, and that is something that we are going to be focusing on in this session as well. As you can see, we've now up to three thousand four hundred and sixty-three uh, um, reviews. The, the the really wonderful thing is that seventy-five percent of them are five star, which is extremely it's gratifying. But what it also tells me, and I have evidence of this from people who email and also on my X feed, aka used to be Twitter, is that it this approach, if you like, to analyzing uh, the chart, trying to make, a, make sense of the price action that we see has resonated with so many traders and not just individual traders, but very, very large groups of traders who have taken the basic concepts and then added their own spin to it, taken, used their own indicators, whether they're proprietary or whether they're standard ones. They maybe have been using uh, a combination of indicators, but what BPA has done, it's kind of taken them things back to first principles, and then you can add on your indicators. Because once you understand the price cycle, which basically what this book is about, and, it, and I have to say, um, it pays great homage to Richard Wyckoff. This is, I haven't sort of, you know, made this up as it were, made this up 10 years ago. It is, it is a progression from the work that has been done by the greats of the past, including Richard Wyckoff. And I've and I'd like to think that in the book, we do uh, pay, as I said, um, homage to those great traders and educators. So, the other bit of news about the book is that the audiobook, the audiobook version, should will also be available in the new year. By some quirk of fate, we live very close to a professional recording studio where they are 
uh, experts in podcasts and audiobooks. They do a lot of audiobook work for the main mainstream publishers. And as I said, they're literally sort of 40 minutes from where we live. And I've uh, I've been talking to their production team and the audiobook version will be uh, made available in the new year. I have had some feedback on that when I announced it on Twitter. A couple of people said, well, how could you know there are charts in there? How can you do an audio book um, where you have images? Well, there is a way you can listen and the the images will be hosted separately or there will be a PDF um, available um, at the same time. Anyway, so that's the news about uh, the book. And when we talk about the analysis on the charts, it's if we are referencing all the concepts that are in the complete guide to volume price analysis. If you've got any questions, please just drop them into the chat box. We'll be more than happy to answer them for you. Okay. A couple of other things that I'd just like to highlight as well before we go over to look at the charts and in particular Meta. Meta has, the reason we've chosen Meta is it's obviously one of the Magnificent Seven. I actually got, I call them the Magnificent Eight because I've actually also put in Netflix into that, into the group of uh, 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 stocks that are leading the, uh, the indices at the moment. But before we go, um, this was actually uh, something that we covered in our Forex webinar, where I suppose Forex traders, they have to pay very close attention to the fundamental releases um, because the currencies do respond very, very strongly. That doesn't mean to say other asset classes don't. And an economic calendar is, is very, very important. What I explained this morning, and I'll just cover here very quickly, is that the, we have economic cycles, we have business cycles, and we have these releases which come onto, uh, which are released every day. As you can see here, you've got retail, you, you've got uh, you, uh, you've got the oil inventories, but you've got GDP, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I suppose that one of the different two things, one of the differences is a few years ago was certainly. Before the, mar before the current market that we have at the moment, a lot of traders didn't really pay a lot of attention to this kind of macro news, as it were. But given what has been going on, certainly with QE and with the Fed and, and the deficit, et cetera, et cetera, and obviously with the inflation problems we've got at, at, at the moment, they are impacting um, the markets more and more, certainly on the um, on, first on the day trading side. And as you can see from this economic calendar, a lot of the releases have actually come out before the start of the market. So you will get the first reaction in the pre-market. Now, this particular calendar, the reason for choosing this particular calendar is that it covers all those countries. You don't need all those countries. I have Canada up here because this was relating to the dollar CAD pair. So you can take that. But it's a really fantastic calendar because obviously you have all the releases for the US today. And as we can see here, what have we had? We have had a GDP, which has come in um, better than expected. Uh, when you have the bold that we see here, these are um, uh, releases that are considered to what are called tier one and are um, are considered to have a greater impact on the markets. Now, that may be so, but releases, fundamental data also fit the, the, the economic and business cycle. And by that, I mean that first of all, you have to recognize which of these releases the Fed pay the closest attention to. We know they pay closest attention to the CPI. We know we know that their preferred um, metric, inflation metric is the PCE. Now, this has come up today, but it's not bold. And that is because the one that they are more focused on is this one, is the core PCE and what they call personal income. Now, they're focused on that at the moment because inflation is taking centre stage. Two or three years ago, there wasn't any inflation. To the extent that the Fed or the central banks wanted inflation, they wanted inflation to be 2%. Now, they, they think we all know what has happened 
with inflation since then. So their focus is on inflation. So all these releases related to inflation are going to be, uh, they're going to have a bigger impact. They already are impactful, but their uh, their impact is going to be even more, as it were. <coughs> Anything to do with employment, uh, the labour market. Two or three years ago, the labour market was ticking along quite happily. Yes, you know, we have some, we have a non-farm payroll. Yeah, you'd get the usual reaction, but certainly not the kind of reaction that you have at the moment. So what I'm trying to say is you read fundamental data in exactly the same way, in, in a sick, it's cyclical. And it's where you are in that cycle, uh, though it's recognizing which of those releases are going to have the biggest impact. Now, the nice thing about this economic calendar is you can also create um ones under a category. So this is an all events one, if you like, this is everything, but you can refine it. And I think this is so cool. So if you look at inflation, for example, it brings up the ones that are specifically tied to inflation. As I said, we know inflation is very, very important. And even if you're a day trader, what you have to know is well, what's coming up. It's, it's part of the kind of background that you can do at the beginning of the trading week and certainly at the beginning of the trading day. So you know in advance that you know what is going to uh, be coming up. It even goes right, uh, it goes all the way through into December. And as I said, you've got the, um, uh, you've got the, the, uh, the, the, the bold ones. Looking back to this, as I said about the CPI, the CPI is very important to the Fed at the moment. But there it is, it's all laid out for you in uh, on a timetable so you know what to expect so you're not going to be surprised when you read on your on your news feed oh the market you know reacted uh, or the market knee-jerk reaction that you get to the market uh, and because you say oh well, what was that all about well at least you will know and you will know in advance and of course you have the interest rates interest rates are hugely important at the moment and yesterday as you know if you were if you were trading if you were watching the markets you know we had a a, a, a nice rally and it was primarily because um well first of all there were three things first of all we had the, the cb um a consumer conference um a consumer survey it used to be called the conference board and it's um People say it's a leading indicator. It's more of a coincident one. It's, it, it, it sort of runs parallel. So it has, it carries a lot of weight with the market. Now that came in um, slightly better than expected. But what really got the market excited yesterday was um, uh, some comments and speeches from uh, Fed Bowman and uh, Fed um, Waller, Fed Waller. And you'll probably read it. Um, the, um, about it in, as I said, in, in your, in your newsfeed. The market doesn't always react to every comment and speech from different members of the Federal Reserve. They certainly do when uh, uh, Jerome Powell speaks. And this is where, and I've mentioned this before, but I'll just go over it again. It's the ones that they will react the most to. It all depends whether they have a vote when the FO, uh, when you have the FOMC. If they don't have a vote, they can I'm not saying they're going to say what they like, but whatever they say, the market says, oh, yeah, that's awfully interesting. But, uh, you know, if you don't get a vote, you're not going to carry a lot of weight in the meetings. But Bowman and Waller certainly do. The other thing to bear in mind is what they say and what the market thinks they say are sometimes are two very different things. The third thing you have to bear in mind is every word that they utter of, is very, very carefully curated. Sometimes they will say things to see how the market will react. So there's this kind of cat and mouse play, a game that's played between members of the Fed and the markets. Now, you see, the question is, well, how do I know? Um, are they a voting member or not? And the best place to go is to go over, just if you type into Google, uh, Fed hawks and doves, uh, you will come up with, uh, there's a couple of other sites, but this is a, a really nice site. And it tells you, it was updated on the 5th of October. So I think everyone is is up to date because there've been a couple of empty chairs for, uh, uh, regional chairs for a little while. And 
on the hawk side and then you've got the, the dove side now what that basically means if they're more hawkish you will find that they they really talk tough on inflation they will they they will do whatever it takes to bring inflation down even if it means raising interest rates until maybe i'm not saying until the economy goes into a recession but they will really really push it they take a much more hard line if you like uh, um on in inflation the doves well they uh, i suppose you could say they're more keynesian david they're much more it's it's it, it's um it's a political thing, if you like, and it goes back to your your understanding of how economies work. But anyway, essentially, they divide down. Now, what's happened is you can see here that the whole of the of the FOMC is very, very skewed to the dovish end of the spectrum. We can see here, and and this little uh, um, uh, uh, this little symbol here will show you to the extent to which they are dovish or not. And the way the market reacts is this. So Kashkari, if he makes some comments and statements that basically sit with his uh, view, his, his dovish position, the market says, yeah, but that's just Kashkari saying what he believes. But if he was to say something that is, you know, that it doesn't, he suddenly is, makes a very what it's it, it, inverted commas hawkish statement then the market will, will really sit up and pay attention now bowman and waller they they sort of sit down here but the whole narrative at the moment is um when if and when interest rates will start to you know start to fall they the problem with the market has at the moment and we have and traders and investors have is that the feds the fed members say one thing but sometimes the market just doesn't believe them and so whatever they said yesterday so if they kind of very you know they they kind of move away from the agreed narrative then you get the bigger reaction as well and of course you have here who votes and who most importantly who will be voting next year so as we move towards the end of the year kashkari his influence if you like on what on the market on what he may say may sort of die down so that's what i just wanted to highlight for you because if we go back to the interest rates here we can see that there's an <laughs> they do crop up with remarkable uh, uh, regularity and on some days as i said yesterday there was one two three four there were five of them out on on the stump okay one today we've got one on Thursday, and of course you've got uh, Powell at four o'clock on Friday. It's obviously the first of December, the the first uh, day of the uh, of the last uh, month for for trading. So that's what I want. Just wanted to um, present to you something that you could go away and discover uh, for yourself as well. Right, Meta. Why have we looking at Meta? I. I've written about Meta on to on a number of occasions on my Facebook page. I've featured it on my on my X feed and also on my blog. And it's an extraordinary company. Whatever you think of Mark Zuckerberg and his business model, it is phenomenally successful. And in fact, there's a little story about uh, Mark Zuckerberg. When we had this reversal in fortune for Meta, and we can see here, we had this massive fall all the way down from the high, way, way down to $85, um, $85 uh, for the stock. From a VPA perspective, let's talk about the VPA perspective, you can see, if you understand, you understand the concepts of VPA, why is that such a significant point on this weekly chart? We can see the fall lower. We can see this, uh, lots of volume coming in there but given the the uh the height of the volume bar and the height of and the range of this candle when we compare it with this one here if that was all selling that would be much much it'd be much much bigger it wasn't so that was the first signal to tell us that possibly the selling in meta was coming to a, a halt there's certainly stopping volume in there but this is really the key candle this candle here it's a very small compressed down candle with a ton of volume underneath it again if that was all selling that candle would be much much lower so that was the point that meta really really took off and as i said 
this is uh, the weekly chart. And when we have uh, the uh, the volatility candles, that is probably around the uh, the earnings. At the time in January, um, I I kind of picked it up. Uh, there and then I wrote about it again in January, and I came across a, an article from a fund manager who was kind of a, a f fessed up that he didn't like Zuckerberg, he really didn't like him as a, as a person, and he had, had allowed his kind of prejudice and his view of uh, of the man to he had missed the first run up. If we go back to right back here, he never got to. So did it get to his low? No, uh, he missed the, if you like, the big move up in Facebook. And he was, I don't even know whether he was actually going to buy some stock because from a technical perspective, it's a fantastic stock. It also coincided the reversal in fortunes for Meta with a statement from uh, Mark Zuckerberg that the company was going to uh, embark on what they call a year, a year of efficiency, David fear efficiency which is basically he was going to cut all the fat from the company make it leaner and therefore make it more profitable and if you have time to go and have a look at the fundamentals for the for the stock you will be truly truly astonished it's it, it cutting cutting um staff cutting waste is always a great way uh, to increase your bottom line, but he has taken it to possibly another level. And of course, it's not a, it doesn't make anything. It's not like a, um, he's got to make a, a, some steel and he's got to worry about the cost of, of commodities. This is all, uh, this is all online. This is all, this is all, this is a service company. It's a, it's software. So the profit margins are potentially huge. So it's a, it's a very solid company and it's got pots and pots of money. So is he going to be able to um, withstand the any rise in interest rates, which a lot of companies, if they have a lot of debt, are going to have to roll over that debt, they are going to uh, suffer if interest rates carry on higher. And I think I looked at, their, uh, at their, their debt, and I think it would take, if they had to settle all their debt, I think it would take them six months. Is it six months, David, to pay off? Yes. So it's a, it's, it's a hugely strong and profitable company. Now, this is not a, uh, a, a recommendation to go and buy an, a, or you know, invest in Meta. I'm just laying out a little bit of the background. In terms of the um, further potential upside to Meta, because it's not at its all-time high, and unlike uh, uh, Apple, say, for example, or, or even Microsoft, is that it would be certainly looking to regain the uh, the 382. Here we are. This candle here, uh, 382. Before, as I said, this this big sell off that we have had in the stock, and it's rather nice. We've almost had a a V shaped uh, uh, reversal um, rally on the stock. Where we are at the moment, um, looking at it from a, a VPA VPA perspective, well, we can see the volume has certainly decreased it is falling part of that volume certainly last week uh, we have um, we've had Thanksgiving and um, the markets were closed and it was only half day on Friday so you do have to also bear in mind when you see this reduction in volume and it certainly approached um, this resistance here from the uh, the outermost band if you like created from the volume point of, con of control. But it's still not in consolidations. It's had a little, so far this week, it's had a little, looks like it's had a little bit of a pullback. If we look at the daily, where are we? We've got pretty much the same here. We are at a, there we are. It's had some, um, it's had attempts to uh, to move higher. This is uh, last week. We've got a uh, Friday. It moved higher, but the volume was already falling on Wednesday. It, the day before Thanksgiving, volume does tend to um, uh, pull back. Trade in, traders uh, close out their positions. The volume there was what was it? It was only ten, uh, ten or so million. What you also, what I also suggest you do is you. Uh, 
if Meta or any other company that you, uh, any stock that you're interested in or company, is always get to know what their average volume is so that you can look on the day and say, oh, it's done twice its average volume or three times its average volume. And then you look at the candle. Has that actually made a difference to the price action? If it hasn't, then that is, you know, it's potentially a red flag. But always bear in mind the context. We're coming up to the holidays, Christmas, not going to be open Christmas Day. There'll be a lot of closing out for the holiday holiday season. Um, a lot of funds close out, whether they close out now, whether they close out in the middle of December. They've got their there's a lot of window dressing that's got to be done for the end uh, for the end of the year. Um, so you've got to look at the context. You've got to look at the time of year. And then, of course, we don't have Thursday at all because the market is closed. And then we have Friday. And as I said, Friday is only half a day. We come back on uh, on Monday. We've got a little bit of weakness. Yesterday, what did we have? Uh, we had uh, 12. And that is that's certainly not what you would expect. But as I said, just go and check it out. There are lots of free resources out there. Finviz is one. Bar Chart is another one. Just have a look at what their average volume is on the day. And also bear in mind how the average volume is calculated. Sometimes it's calculated over 90 days. Other times it's calculated over um, a slightly shorter period of time so that you're comparing if you compare two stocks, comparing apples with apples, use the same resource as as it were. Right. This is what we've had today. So there we are. What do we have yesterday? We had an update, not an awful lot of volume. Was there any indication that we were going to have an up, uh, a down day today? And this is where you can look at the faster time frames. We know that it's not in a consolidation, it's not in a, in a tight range. So the chances are we are going to get sort of a trend uh, on, the, on the day when a stock or a, a chart is in a tight consolidation on a slower time frame. If it's a nice wide one, the chances are you could get what's called a good, you know, some two way tape. Otherwise, it's, um, but if it's in some kind of trend and it's a strong upwards trend, then the bias is to the long side and traders and the traders will certainly be looking for, if you like, to buy the dip because they believe the rally is going to carry on higher. What I've done on this five minute chart is I've done some, normally I have the extended hours on the chart that I haven't on this occasion. I've actually put regular market hours because I looked at it and I thought, hmm, this is yesterday as we see towards the end of the session. And I appreciate it's the end of, uh, of the session. So, you know, we do have to be a little bit a little bit careful. Did you see that notice come up? Who didn't? Did you, David? No. no? Okay. Um, and essentially, the, the meta looked to end up quite strongly. Why? Because prices were going up. And if you looked at the volume, it was actually on rising volume. Normally, at the end of the session, it's fairly flat or you know, nothing. You say, oh, it's the end of the session. Everybody packs up and goes home and you've got the post market and then whatever goes on in the post market is fine. And I looked at that and I thought, well, that's interesting because it's the end of the session. You've got this really very nice volume and you've got rising prices. But look at the spread. The spreads are narrowing. And I thought, well, I wonder if that's going to have what impacts, if any, that's going to have today. And blow me down, here we are. After that run up yesterday, as I said, triggered by uh, this, uh, the um, by the Fed members, suddenly we have everything has uh, has a tipped over as, as it were. We have a volatility candle with a reasonable amount of volume. We then have um, a little up candle, not a lot of volume under it at all. And it actually carries on lower. We do have this attempt to rise here, and I accept we've got a, a, a wick to the bottom of the candle. So anyone looking to go long based on yesterday, thinking, oh, I'm buying the dip, if you like, in, in inverted commas, you would see that, and you would see that volume underneath there. And you think, well, do you know what? That's not a bad 
possibly a, a bad place to to uh, to to place a long and a long position, and that would be perfectly uh, reasonable and a rational thing to do. What you what I've also put on here, which could possibly um, help as as it were, and that is. This is a Renko chart. This is a, what we call a time accurate chart for, and it's only available on TradingView. And what it does, it it follows the although it's non time based, we've 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 managed to make it follow the time chart more closely than a than a normal Renko. And what it does is, it first of all, it takes out takes out the noise and by the noise I mean the wicks and the and the choppiness and and the volatility and if we looked at it we could see that it actually flipped over went a little bit sideways but stayed red and then it carried on lower so ignoring that if if we had this you could have ignored that carried on and at what point do you think that this move lower is possibly going to um, uh, reverse. Well, the obvious point is if it gets to a, the volume point of control, because this is, uh, it, it acts as support and resistance. It acts as very strong support and resistance. We actually got through this um, uh, a strong support here. It carried on lower. You have a lot of volume under that, under that uh, candle there. And you think, okay, it's going on lower, but because it's come to VPA is also support and resistance because it's at the volume point of control. You have to be, um, you have to be a little bit patient. You say, well, let's see what happens with the next candle. And in fact, it does. Some buying comes in around the one, and it goes sideways. And this is what you would expect when you come to the end of a, of a move, of a, of a, a trend, a micro trend, as, as just, just call it a move. The normal reaction after that is you would expect to see stopping volume, you would expect to see some consolidations and moving sideways, and then you would see the reversal. Now this, I think, and these three candles here, and this little bit, this is really what I think, and David, believes as well sets vpa apart because you see that you accept that and you think right because you are waiting for the reversal which you think uh, will come off the volume point of control you see three candles three green candles but you see the volume falling and if you only take away one vpa setup signal it would be this when you see this reversal rally a attempt to rally but it is not supported by volume and you see it's an anomaly that should be the biggest red flag and it's telling you be patient and wait this is a trap move it is most definitely a trap move it actually runs into this strong resistance what happens it goes back to the volume point of control and then you actually get an acceleration of uh, the selling, you have volume rising, and then what do you get? You get another anomaly. You get this little candle here, very squashed candle. You've also got a pivot. You're at the outer limit of the uh, of the VPOP. That is the point where if it's going to reverse, it is more likely to reverse. It did reverse here, but we know it wasn't going to carry on higher, and that is where that would be. So if you'd caught that one there, you could have certainly come out at this point. And if you were looking to take uh, the pos position to the upside, then this is what would have prevented you because of this relationship between the price action and the volume. And looking at the Renko chart, what we have, it picks up the um, the uh, the congestion. And yes, we have the two little bricks here, but you always read it in conjunction with the VPA the price action, the volume, and you think, no, that's that's not going to happen. And it does carry on lower. And then, you know, you've got a potential for uh, a, a reversal. It's a bit, it's really not going very far. This resistance here has, uh, has is really capping any move, but we're still green. 
we're flat green because we're kind of moving sideways. I'm not sure what the market is going to do for the rest of the day. Um, if you want to look it at on a on a and as I said multiple time frames, this is the hourly chart. And again, what I've done is I've taken the extended hours on. I've just used the um, the um, uh, the regular hours. This is the this is that big candle down that we have here. A lot of volume underneath it. Then we carry on lower. We can break from the volume point of control here. But look, the volume is is falling at the same time. If you read it together, which you should do with uh, multiple time frames. If you can't cope with three, four, five, I mean, David will show you when I pass over to him. He has six. He can have as many as six charts up. At least look at two charts. Look at the chart that you're looking to take the trade off, and look at what I call the benchmark chart. And the reason I have a Camarilla on this one is because the levels that are on the are on the Camarilla indicator here, these are valid for the rest of the week. So the levels that are displayed are very, very important. We, we've got the, the price levels here from the accumulation and distribution. We've got the uh, volume point of control. And in fact, going back to the five minute chart, in fact, let me just pull it this way, it's easier. I move this one out and I move this one out. You can see it a little bit better. Right. Where it has actually stopped here, we can see here, it is just above the volume point of control on the hourly chart. Levels on a slower time frame always trump. They always carry more weight. So yes, we had this little reversal. Yes, we had the break higher from the volume point of control. We then hit this resistance, but it is also co uh, coincides with what we have down here on the volume point of control on the hourly chart. And then we have our uh, um, Camarilla levels as well. And my final my final thing about um, 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 Meta, let's just have a look. Um, where are we here? There we are is a quick look at the options market from the perspective of the put the put and call ratio and you can see everyone is very positive if that were um, anything under one it tells us that there are more calls than puts so the market is uh, the certainly the option market is very long at the moment for meta Right. That's what I've got to say. I'm just going to pass over to David. And as I said, if you've got any questions on anything I've said, please just put them into the chat box and we're happy to answer them for you. Hi, everyone. And uh, good to have you with us this evening. Well, it's evening here. Uh, I don't know where it's, what the time is in your part of the world, but uh, it's uh, early evening here in the UK. So good to have you with us. Uh, I'm just going to move the chat box out of the way. Um, I just wanted to have a look at Meta on two different platforms. I've got Ninja and I've got TradingView, and also to look at them in the context of um, the three new volume indicators that we've rolled out recently, which is the uh, the VWAP, the VRSI, and the MSI, the Market Strength Indicator, the Volume Weighted Average, and the uh, Volume Strength. Uh, volume relative strength and they're all volume based so in addition they complement the uh, volume point of control the accumulation distribution and so on and so forth so we have a a bank if you like of, of volume indicators and i mentioned multiple time frames i tend to have six which is what i've got here um, they wouldn't necessarily span this particular array of time horizons because it goes from one minute top left right the way down to the daily on the top right. But I just want to have the daily here. We go up to 15 minute and then skip across the daily. But I just want to have the daily here just really for context because you've seen it on Anna's chart. And it just, when you're trading intraday, it does help to frame what it is you are doing. I, am I trading as an intraday trader with the dominant trend? What is the dominant trend for this stock? Um, and by the dominant trend longer term, we're looking at the daily, we might be looking at the hourly if we're really scalping or the half hour, whatever it is, you have to establish what you're outlined this morning, as I explained this morning. It's very much about, it's 
it's like a, we're looking at you are looking at a monitor screen here of six time frames and really that's how you have to think of it in terms of defining the your field of vision if you will and the fact that you're not interested in time frames to the downside and you're not interested in time frames to the upside whatever it is you're trying to do if you're trying to scalp then at some point you have to have a a shutter that comes down and says okay i'm 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 trading this intraday. I'm on the, I don't know, one, three, five minute time horizon or one, two, three, whatever it may be. And my fastest term or my slowest term of reference is in that scenario might be 15 minutes. It might be 30 minutes just to give me a sense of, of what is going on longer term. And that's only looking at it in the context of the stock or whatever it is you're trading. In addition to that, and I'll flick over in a moment you you would also look obviously what are the what are the primary indices doing and i've got those set up on the market strength indicator which not only gives you a view on whether they are all going in the same direction but it also gives you a view on whether the stock you're trading intraday is also moving in the same direction or are you trading against the dominant trend for that index or the indices on mass is the stock doing something unusual because it's had a good earnings release or it's had something that is driving it one direction and maybe the indices are going in the other direction or the primary index that that stock sits in is going in a completely different direction. So it's and hence the reason that we have mon multiple monitors because to capture all this information and keep a track on all this information of which volatility is also a key element as well. You're trying to look at all these moving pieces it's like looking at i suppose the inner workings of a watch where you've got this multiple array of tiny little wheels and mechanisms going on and you're trying to keep track of what is going on in all the various pieces whatever context you're doing and of course in amongst all that you've got the options market which is now so dominating and it, probably it is the one aspect of this business of making money whether you're a trader whether you're an investor it is the options market that has really changed beyond all recognition even in the space of the last five years when anna and i first started options was a was a backwater it was just it, it wasn't even in the, the the sort of mind's eye of most people now it is absolutely center front on everything and it it is it i wouldn't say it dictates but it is getting to a stage where it really does dominate very strongly what is going on in terms of stocks both intraday and longer term as well so this is the workspace with the vwap now the vwap so uh, and it is a is a go-to indicator if you're a stock trader it is very much the go-to indicator and what we've done with it is let's just open one of these up let's go to the five minute make it bigger easier to see there we go what we've done as always is we've tried to add value to this and the way we've done that is to combine five indicators into one so if i click on indicators here and go down to the vwap i've only got two indicators on here i've just got as you can see i've got the vwap and i've got uh, volume on here as well um, but the the vwap itself is in fact five indicators in one the the vwap the traditional vwap which you see here resets at the start of every trading session and that's the reason up here that you see it um, really compressed back to zero because this is the point <coughs> excuse me this is the point at which it starts its calculation for the new session so every new session starts back at zero in terms of its calculation um, and that's how it's designed to work. Now, on this case, I've got this on the uh, uh, pre-market here. So the physical market is opening here at 2.30. So the VWAP is working in pre-market. And just to change tack for a moment, I want a data series just to show you that as well. I've got the trading hours here set to extended trading hours. You can change that accordingly down the bottom there. I won't go and do it now, but uh, you can have either regular trading hours or you can go to the extended where you get all the trading per se. So if we go back in here, back to where we were, just down to the VWAP, there we go. As I say, it's five indicators in one. Now the traditional VWAP resets at every time the new session starts, so it goes back to zero. 
that's how it's designed to work. That's how the algorithm works. The second one there, the MVWAP, is the moving volume weighted average. And the difference between that and the, the first VWAP is that it provides a continuous ribbon of calculation. So where you have this stopping point on the VWAP here and a reset with every new session, with the moving VWAP, it bypasses that completely and it just incorporates the uh, extended trading hours into its calculation. It's a much smoother one. It's To be honest, it's what I prefer because what it does is it smooths out the initial candles where you're starting from zero with the traditional VWAP. What the moving VWAP does, as the name suggests, it just moves straight through. It's like a moving average, so it's very smooth. So it gives you a much better perspective certainly on the uh, on the pre-market sessions and post where the the price is is sitting in com in relationship to the the VWAP and the outer envelopes so that's the moving VWAP the AVWAP is the anchored which allows you to physically pick the starting point that you want so rather than being tied to a moving uh, VWAP or being tied to a VWAP that starts at the, at the start of the session you have the option to you to anchor it where you wish. So it's very much like uh, Fibonacci, for example, where you can pick your spots. So you would pick key points. You'd pick those points which are important, a particular high that is very significant or a significant low, and it will start the calculation from those points. So you have complete control with the anchored VWAP. The time VWAP is the only one that doesn't use volume. It uses time instead, but uses it in a similar way. And finally, we have the interday, uh, which uh, perhaps not the, not the greatest name we came up with, but what it does is it allows us to put the VWAP onto much slower time frame. So that's the one you would use for investing decisions, for example, where you're looking at the dailies, weeklies, and monthlies, because all of these work on an intraday basis. So those are the five. And, and in terms of what you see and the way the VWAP is, is viewed, if you like, it's viewed very much the same as the volume point of control. This central line here, this line here, that is the, the VWAP itself. And then these outer envelopes, the upper envelope and the lower envelope are one standard deviation. And you can adjust that. I've got this set to one, which is typically what we use, but you can set it to one, one and a half, or even two if you wish to go that far out. And that really gives you a sense of the, the fair value because what traders will look at certainly in terms of this VWAP line itself is is the price fair value in other words is it below that in which case it would potentially be considered to be underpriced and if it's above that level and getting up to this sort of region then it's considered to be potentially overpriced and that's really the way you view it and as you can see what tends to happen there's two things that really happen which really jump off the chart at you when you're using the indicator. The first one is how the the price action really follows the these envelopes. It really does tend to to mirror them and and, and bounce off them. And it, it is these extremes that we're always looking for. The VWAP line in the center really presses down. And the second aspect is the number of times that that level is revisited. When the price comes back and revisits it, either from the upside or the downside, and then you find it just carries on down. And you've got exactly the same here. The price has reverted. It's come back up. It's revisiting this area again, and it's really struggling to get through there. Now, obviously, the beauty of the indicator is you're not just using it in isolation. You are using it with volume price analysis as well. So you have volume underneath there. So you've got traditional uh, volume relationship down here and you have the VWAP indicator, which is sitting above. And it is an, an indicator that um, is hugely, hugely influential for many different reasons, not least because a lot of the institutional orders that are going through the market now are very much based off the VWAP. So that's why it has quite a big influence. I've actually recorded um, quite a lot of, in, uh, of videos, which you'll find on the Quantum site if you head over over there onto the video library for uh, it. This is available on NinjaTrader and it's available on 
trading view at the moment and we will be rolling it out for TradeStation and for MT45 in due course as well. But the videos you can find there at the moment are on NinjaTrader and on TradingView platform. Pretty quiet at the moment, gone into sideways, but as you can see, bouncing off the VWAP here, really not uh, getting through there and doing pretty much the same thing across the timeframes. This is down onto the 15 minute, really moving sideways. And here we are on the daily chart really up at the extreme this is our vwap this is our outer envelope the top uh, top edge envelope which is uh, as i say one standard deviation away from the vwap in a congestion phase possibly building into a two bar reversal here on the day we'll see what that closes at so potentially and as i've explained in some of these videos the we don't subscribe to the view that a lot of intraday traders take which is once the price crosses the vwap then that is a signal to either buy or sell it is too simplistic in our humble opinion what we look for is we are looking at the extremes here we're looking at the outer envelopes either to the upside or the downside but reinforce with volume price analysis below and that i guess is the key difference because what we're looking for is setups for opportunities for buying or selling whatever the time frame once we get up to these outer levels the upper or the lower envelopes as we call them then we're looking at uh, volume from uh, the volume price analysis perspective excuse me one moment sorry about that I had a frog in my throat and really reinforcing the decision. So it's not a decision which is purely based on one indicator. Nothing ever is. Um, so I reinforce that 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 point, if I may. So that's on the VWAP. Now, if we go over onto um, Trading View, what I've set up here is the second, which is the market strength indicator. And if you're familiar with the currency strength indicator, which I know some of you are because I can see some names down on the right hand side that recognize some of our students on the Forex program. Um, if you're familiar with that indicator, then what that shows you is it's showing you several things. First of all, it shows you potential opportunities for overbought and oversold. So if you're looking for an opportunity to get into a stock that's overbought, or a stock that's oversold, then you're looking at the outer extremities. So that's one, certainly one way to view the indicator in the same way that you would a currency strength indicator. The second way of using it is that we are looking for the strength of a trend in the same way we do on the CSI. We're looking for the gradient at which the price is rising. If it's rising at a nice steep gradient like here, then that's a pretty strong indication that we've got a nice strong trend developing. So that is the second way of using the indicator. It doesn't mean that you're trading off extremes, you're maybe gonna jump in a trend. Once this starts to rise, you may be happy to jump in the trend. And of course, you're looking at this, we are looking at it in isolation here, but you would use, be using this alongside the chart. So the charts would be reinforcing this, you'd be looking at volume as well putting it all together. It's not just looking at one indicator in isolation. The other thing that this indicator also allows us to do, as I have set up here, pull this over a little bit, is I have the four primary indices. Meta is the purple line here. So as you can see, we had a little bit of a rollover in Meta here, rolling down. This is on the three minute. This is on the five minute. And exactly the same way when you look at trends across time frames you have to wrap your head around the idea that what you're seeing on a faster time frame like the two minute here on the left hand side is a is a micro element if you will of what is happening on a slower time frame it's it's like the russian doll scenario where you have a tiny little doll in the center and gradually they be, that you've got more and more and more of them until you arrive at the one on the outer, outside which is a huge doll and it's it's very much the same as this. It's wheels within wheels. So you are constantly dealing with that issue. And it goes back to what I was saying just now about defining your time frame and trying to to contain that within a, 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 a box, if you like, where you're not moving outside that and you're really focused on what is going on in my time horizon. So for someone over here, 
for example, on this two minute time frame, they may they may well have scalped uh, some some dollars out of out of Meta just reversing down here. For someone looking at this over on a five minute, ten minute, maybe fifteen minute, they might be seeing this just as a minor pullback and therefore perhaps something not to be too concerned about. So it depends where you are. It depends where you are in the in the investing or trading spectrum of what you're trying to do. So what I've got here, as I say, I've got the four indices set up. And what that also gives you, it gives you a straight visual on several things. It gives you a visual on whether those indices are all moving in lockstep, which you would hope they would be. We've got uh, the, the four of them. We've got the YM, the NQ, the ES, and uh, Russell. And what you will see on here from time to time, because it's not always the case that all the indices move together. Often they don't. Um, earlier on, NASDAQ was falling because it was being driven by those stocks in NASDAQ, which are, are key uh, and major. Um, whereas y YM was rising a little bit. So it's not always the case. And, and often in the last two, three, four years, we've seen days where uh, one index will be falling quite strongly, another might be in congestion, and the third or fourth might be rising quite strongly. And of course, of these, uh, Russell is certainly the highest risk because you're dealing with companies of, of much smaller size. And therefore, the risk in that index is much greater. And often you will see the Russell diverging from what the, the the three sisters as we call them are doing so what i've got set here i've got the the green is the russell the uh this um i don't know pinky line here is the uh, nq the blue is the ym i think yes and meta is the purple and then we've got the es here which is the the orangey line at the top here so what it gives you is a, a very simple visual and of course what you can also do with this i say of course what you can do with this uh indicator is you're not you're not restricted to uh particular indices you can go in and add them so if you go into the settings up here you can have up to five instruments here and they could be um we could have stocks we can have indices we can have commodities we can have whatever we want but it's just a really nice, simple way. And of course, it also incorporates volume. So it's looking at the volume price relationship and it's trying to give us a view on the extent of whether a stock or an index is overbought or oversold. And as I have here, a very simple relationship between those three indices. Now, in addition to that, for example, we might want to put the dollar on here. So we put uh, a, a uh, the U UUP, we put the uh, the dollar ETF on here. So we might have that just to give us a sense of what is going on in terms of the dollar. Or we might have the CSI alongside, uh, again, just to give us a, uh, a direct view on whether the dollar is rising, falling, and how that is likely to impact um, equities into intraday. So I wanted to just highlight that one for you. Just move those back over there. And over on the other um, tab here, again, this is Meta. This is uh, a range of time frames. We go from uh, 10 minutes, sorry, a big pardon, one minute, three minute, five minute, 10 minute, down to the 15, 30, one day, and down to the weekly here. And this is with the third of the volume indicators, which is the VRSI, the volume relative strength indicator. Again, I've done an absolute ton of videos on of these up on the quantum trading site. So I'm not going to go through it in great detail here, but what I do want to highlight for you really is what the indicator does is it's all about pressure. And if you listen to some of those videos, you'll hear us mention the word or hear me mention the word pressure all the time, because when you're looking at a trend, and this is really a nice example of what we're witnessing right now. When you're looking at a trend, what you want to see associated with that trend is pressure. In other words, has that trend got some real momentum to it? Because if it doesn't have any momentum, then it really isn't going to go very far. And really, that's what the indicator is all about. And it does that really in two different ways. It does it in terms of, of a color change. And you can see it here when we had a lot of volume coming in. And this is that the, the volume relative strength indicator is looking at the relative nature of volume from one bar to another. So if you like, it's taking volume price analysis and 
peeling back a layer, as I've described it, to, to really look at the relative nature and to try and give us a perspective on how strong is the pressure that is being supplied for this trend and therefore do we expect this trend to continue for a while because if it has no pressure and you can view this in very much the same way as we view volume and that's the beauty of it because pressure and volume i guess you could look at consider them in similar ways we look at the height of these pressure bars we look at how the relationship we look at their relationship to the price action and as you can see here we have this little rally and yes the the pressure is diminishing but we've never really got to a point where we've crossed over into bullish territory all that's happened is the pressure the upwards pressure here we have some upwards momentum but it's very very weak it's declining and it really hasn't got into positive territory to show us that we're moving into a bullish phase and all we've done is flatline with these very, very low pressure bars. And we're now starting to, to, it looks as though it's starting to roll over. You can see it here starting to develop over on three. Perhaps if I pop that one up full size, let's put that one up full size. There we go. And really that's what's happened. You, you have this, you can see, let me just pull this up as well. And it'll just give you an idea of the relative nature. There we go. I pull it up to the absolute maximum. This is the sort of pressure that was developed as a result of this price waterfall. And it's self-evident just purely from the height of the bars, irrespective of the color changes where we go from the brighter color to the darker color, which suggests a slight diminishing in that pressure. We see this rally, we see this falling away. But when you see this, this reversal here, and what's interesting about this particular price waterfall is when you compare it to the pressure associated with this one, it's very, very much weaker. So we don't expect it to go that much further. Just put it right up. There we are. It goes a little way. It's a nice move, but it doesn't have the strength that we have over here. And again, it really comes back to this whole business of comparison and comparative nature of both volume and what we have here, which is pressure with the volume relative strength indicator. And really, this does demonstrate where we move into the, to the upside. Obviously, the fulcrum line here is is your crossover point between uh, bullish and bearish. So we've gone from, from bearish here. We're now moving up into, bur into bullish. But look at the height of these bullish bars. They are tiny. And when you look at it in relationship to the height of the, the selling pressure down here, there's virtually none. It's very, very small. So we don't really expect to see this move develop because it doesn't have that strength of pressure behind it. And now what we're starting, it gets even worse here. It goes almost down to nothing, to a flat line completely. And now we are starting to see maybe a development of a little bit of bearish pressure coming in again and perhaps a move back down to this sort of level. So that's what the indicator does. I wanted to really just show you that in, in the context of Meta. And it really brings together the two elements of VPA and this relative nature of volume, which is so important. But the other thing about this indicator, which again, whenever we build these indicators, we try to incorporate other aspects. And the other aspect with this is very much along the same lines as we use with the trend monitor. The trends and the trend monitor, the trend monitor was really developed alongside the trends to take a slower perspective on the trend, to try to help to keep you in a trend once it starts to reverse against you, because that is the biggest issue we all face as whether we're traders or investors when a market starts to slow a stock starts to slow down we've got some decent profit in it then we see a pullback we panic we get out and then the stock continues in the original direction it happens all the time the market makers are well aware of that it's what they do all the time it is their mechanism of frightening you or or getting you to panic to make an emotional trading decision. And what the indicators we try and develop are there to help you stay in those positions through those trends when you do have these reversals and pullbacks to try and identify what is genuine and what is not genuine. And to go back to the example that Anna used on, um, on her TradingView platform when she was looking, at, I think it was the weekly chart for Meta, 
and you saw that little uh, three bar rally and you saw the little rally and you saw the volume falling away, that tells you instantly that that is not going very far because you have an anomaly. You have rising price, but you've got falling volume. So when you combine an indicator like this with our VPA analysis, where that is what we call a secondary trend, and we have tertiary trends as well. But when, you're, when you've got a secondary trend developing like that against what is the primary, and in that case, the primary was lower, and you've got a secondary which is higher, is that secondary a physical reversal? In other words, are we going from primary to primary, or is it simply primary with a secondary pullback and we expect the primary to be reestablished? If you can answer that question with any degree of confidence, then that is going to help you hugely to stay in positions and stop you panicking and making that emotional exit position when you're taking your profit off the table because you've you know you, you've maybe had two or three losses and finally you've got a winning position and you don't want to lose it you grab it you bank it and you watch and then you watch in horror as the stock moves off in the same direction and you realize that what you've witnessed is a secondary pullback against the primary so it's using all this information in conjunction it's using indicators like this the vrsi using it with VPA to really to really um, give you the confidence to stay in. And what I've done on just another workspace very quickly, just to show that in action, I think I've got it up here. Uh, yeah, here we are. Right, this is Meta right now. And this is a one minute, three minute, five minute combination. And at the bottom, exactly the same time frame. So one minute, three minute, five minute. And the only difference the only difference is I've got VRSI on the top and I've got standard vanilla volume on the bottom, nothing else. Because what it demonstrates is it demonstrates that relationship, what the VRSI is trying to show you graphically, and you can then reinforce that by what is going on visually below. We've got a bit of an anomaly here. Why is this candle anomalous on the three minute? Because the volume here is pretty much the same we had a widespread down candle. Okay, fine. We can say that's our benchmark candle, maybe. What happens on the next one? We've got slightly higher volume, narrower spread, wick to the lower body. We've got the next candle comes along. Again, narrow spread, relatively decent volume, not quite as much as these two, but nevertheless, not far off it. So at the very least, if you're looking at this as an intraday trader, you would be expecting something to happen, at least congestion, possibly a full-blown reversal, but at the very least congestion. And if you're expecting it, then that takes away a lot of the surprise element, the element that says, oh my goodness, what do I do now? Why is this doing this? Why is it reversed? Well, you know why it's reversed because you've seen it here. It's telling you that you are going to see some reaction because you've got some buying coming in here. This has to be buying. I wouldn't classify it directly as stopping volume, but that's pretty much what it is because all things being equal, if that's your benchmark candle in this tiny little microcosm of price action, this one should be wider still and down off the page. Well, not quite off the page, but down here somewhere. So it should at least be similar to that one, and it's nowhere near similar to that one. Equally for this one, maybe not as wide as that one, but you expect something, I don't know, around this sort of size, and it isn't. So what's happened? The market's reversed. You're not surprised, you're not horrified, you're not shocked because it's what you were expecting. And when you look at it over here, we've got a similar sort of uh, picture developing. If you look at the equivalent three minute up here, we had some decent pressure coming in here. That pressure has now waned dramatically. We expect to see it because we're seeing it with volume. We're now moving back to the, the midpoint here of fulcrum, if you like, and then you know on we go reading our chart. As I said this morning in the Forex uh, session, it's like reading a, a piece of sheet music. It really, truly is like that. You're, you're reading the notes as the music's like, a I don't know, a, a, an old pianola, if you've ever seen one of those where um, it, it plays off a, off a roll of, of, of paper which has punched um, holes in it, which play the, play the notes. It's very similar to that in that you're looking, you're reading, you're reading at the live edge, and you're incorporating all these elements and what underpins everything is volume price analysis to give you all those 
signals that we can then read. I mean, I'm looking at the one minute right now. What do we see on the one minute? Again, very simple VPA lessons. Uh, we got uh, a narrow spread candle here, but the volume is very low. So that you can say is in agreement. It's what we expect to see. Volume and price are in agreement. We've got a narrow spread, but we've got relatively low volume. We then get this candle. Is this is this anomalous? Yes, of course it is, because we've got a lot of volume gone in there. We've got a little wick, narrow spread candle. So there's a bit of weakness coming in there. Is that enough to drive this market lower? Doesn't look like it at the moment because we've got a wick developing here. But nevertheless, at the very least, you would expect, again, if you saw this on a slower time frame chart, you would expect a pause point. We work, we are on a very fast time frame chart. Up here, you can see the VRSI is holding up here above the, uh, the, the fulcrum line. So it's what I was saying earlier on. It's about giving you this confidence. Now, that will give you a little bit of confidence to say, OK, it's still saying blue. It's still above the line there. So, OK, I'm, I'm not going to be shaken out on that one just yet because it looks as though it might carry on for a little bit. And really, that's what this all comes down to is, is giving you that confidence to hold a position, whatever it is you're trying to do on an intraday basis or longer term, and not be frightened out on emotional responses. So there we are. I'm going to wrap up there. That's uh, that's our, we've covered a lot on, on Meta there and, and quite a lot of the uh, indicators as well. Um, just have a quick look at the questions here. Where are we? Where are we? Where are we? Um, will it be very? Yes, it is. We we put these sessions up on YouTube, so uh, you'll probably find them up on uh, YouTube tomorrow. If you head over, if you're not um, subscribed to Anna's channel, then um, do subscribe because that will just flag up when the next videos go up. Um, so just on the subscription button, just just smash the like button there and subscribe. But yeah, they all go up on the YouTube channel. You may find them in, in uh, one or two pieces. Sometimes we break them up, but these will be going up uh, full size, I think. Um, uh, how is it possible to have VWAP in the daily charts? Um, the VWAP we have, uh, uh, Leonardo, we've, um, we've uh, created that VWAP, the one I mentioned, the interday VWAP, which works over uh, the longer term timeframes and crosses across the sessions but then that's the same for the moving vwap as well the mvwap that will also bypass the reset of the vwap so it works as a moving average in fact if you want to see that in action we can just hop over there nice little rally developing we've now got to you can see uh you know we didn't want to be frightened out here and we weren't we've held in it's now coming back so you know we're happy days We've got rising pressure here. Look at this little rising pressure run up here. So that's nice. That's telling us we've got rising pressure, rising volume. And you see how it relates to uh, volume price analysis in the same way. If we were looking at these as volume bars, we would say, oh, yeah, we've got rising volume bars and we've got rising price. Happy days, price and volume in agreement. That's how it all works. So it all fits together. Let me just go back to that workspace with the VWAP, and I'll just very quickly show you that. Uh, where are we down the bottom here? Here we go um let's just pick one of these go on to the five minute okay just go down to the indicator onto the vwap and we just flick it over onto the mvwap and we just apply that okay and now what you see happens is that this is the same period of price action this is the pre-market but now what happens is the vwap moves through that seamlessly and you can see that across all the time frames there it is right the way through so there is no stop start. It's a constant flow. It is a constant ribbon. I like it because what it does through these pre-market areas is it gives you a sense of what is going on in the pre-market, whether we are below the VWAP, above the VWAP, and where are we? Uh, because when you reset the VWAP on the traditional VWAP, for the first five, six, seven candles, you really don't get that sense. You're kind of all over the place. So I like using the, um, uh, I prefer the, the MVWAP myself. Um, but we bundle them all together to give our customers, our traders, our students as much um, opportunity. You decide what you want to use. It's not, you know, you're not uh, investing in one indicator. It's five in one. So you decide which one you prefer. And that's how it works. So there we go. Hope that answers that one. Um, there we go. Thank you so much for coming along today. Hope uh, this evening. Um, hope you've enjoyed the session. We will be back next week with um, more, uh, probably the two sessions, the Forex and the Stocks on uh, Wednesday, which is kind of our preferred day. So I hope you've enjoyed it. Enjoy the rest of the trading session. 
and the rest of the trading week. And thank you so much for coming along. We do appreciate it and hope you've enjoyed it. So bye for now.